Welcome, everybody. I'm Ian Vasquez, Vice President for International Studies here at the Cato Institute. Globalization and the free market generally have come under fire in the past two decades from both the left and the right. Capitalism is blamed for rising inequality, the uncontrolled use of limited resources, and for le leaving people and uh, entire nations vulnerable to economic and other types of turmoil. This view has affected the politics and the policies of both rich and poor countries and of democracies and non-democracies. Indeed, the attack on capitalism has coincided with the rise of populism, nationalism, and various forms of authoritarianism around the world. But what is the real record of free markets and globalization? How has humanity actually fared as the world has become more integrated and with the spread of voluntary exchange? Is the return of trade protectionism, industrial planning, and greater reliance on redistribution liable to work any better today than it did in the past? And what about new challenges like climate change or the rise of China or high-tech uh, companies? Do they justify rolling back the market in favor of political control, or does the dynamism and innovation of capitalism still render the new critiques of the market lacking? In his new book, uh, The Capitalist Manifesto, Why the Global Free Market Will Save the World, Johan Norber makes a much needed, impassioned, and fact-filled case in favor of economic freedom. I'm delighted that he's joining us uh, today to explain the dangers of moving away from the global free market and why globalization offers the best hope for humanity. Johan is a senior fellow here at the Cato Institute and a writer who focuses on globalization, human progress, and intellectual history. He is the author and editor of more than 20 books translated into more than 30 languages. They include In Defense of Global Capitalism, which he published some 20 years ago, Progress, 10 Reasons to Look Forward to the Future, and Open, The Story of Human Progress. Both of those latter books were named by The Economist as a book of the year in 2016 and the year 2020, respectively. Johan Norberg is a writer and host of numerous television documentaries on subjects uh, ranging from energy, economics, Sweden, India, and Adam Smith. His articles and opinion pieces uh, appear regularly in U.S. and international newspapers, and he is a frequent commentator on television, radio, and internet programs. Please help me welcome Johan. Thank you. Ian, and uh, thank you, Chris, for agreeing to discuss these ideas with me in my new Capitalist Manifesto. Now, why did I write a Capitalist Manifesto? Even a manifesto sounds like a very loaded term, right? Um, I just noticed on Amazon Books that uh, people who are interested in your book might be interested in this one, pointing us to another manifesto by Mr. Marx and Engels uh, instead. <laughs> That's not the way it works, Mr. Algorithm, but uh, um, it tells you something about manifestos. Well, my manifesto is a bit different. There are many uh, different capitalist manifestos, actually, but just one communist one, because that's an orthodoxy. Whereas when it comes to capitalism and free markets, we appreciate variety, experiments, different viewpoints, and competition. And I wrote this one because I thought it was time that we needed one. We had to restate the principles of free markets and of uh, economic freedom again in this day and age. Because, I don't know, did, did you watch the latest Indiana Jones movie, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny? I watched it, I really enjoyed it, but not for the social commentary, uh, <laughs> because in one very um, fraught scene, Indiana Jones uh, accuses the villain that uh, you stole it, referring to an ancient, invaluable mechanism. But the villain, played by Mads Mikkelsen, uh, responds, then you stole it. And then Indiana Jones' goddaughter re intervenes, saying, and then I stole it. It's called capitalism. <laughs> um, 
And actually, that seems pretty representative of the uh, general idea of capitalism in this day and age. The views in social media and some social science institutions are not better informed, uh, I think, and sometimes even more hostile, especially right now. A recent poll said that uh, no more than 21% of Americans think that uh, they have a very positive view of capitalism, which actually means that three times more Americans are convinced that they have experienced a ghost than have experienced the positive benefits of capitalism. And it gets even worse among the young, 46% uh, of whom think that humanity is doomed, according to a recent um, poll. And that's the fashionable narrative right now that the rich got richer and the poor got poorer, uh, the economy was de-industrialized, inequality surged, it was taken over by big tech and the rise of China, and limited resources were uh, exploited and we saw global warming. Neoliberalism, whatever that is, is supposed to be dead. And governments from Washington to Brussels to New Delhi and Beijing think that now's the time to step back in with a heavy hand of government to repatriate dangerous, dangerously globalized supply chains, to become active in industrial policy again, and to um, part because of geopolitical tensions, part because of global supply chains supposedly failing during the pandemic. This time around, it comes from both sides. When I wrote this book that Ian mentioned 20 years ago, Defending Global Capitalism, it was mostly against a, an anti-free uh, trade left. Now I hear the same kind of arguments being repeated on the right. I hear a lot of talk about how this is not a bipartisan age and the different sides cannot agree on anything. I think that's all wrong. They do agree. They do agree now, I hear it from both left and the right, that the American experiment in freedom and free markets have failed. And now we need the government to step in and point out the important uh, industries of the future and to repatriate supply chains. Robert Lighthizer, uh, Donald Trump's trade czar recently say, explained that libertarianism is a philosophy for stupid people because you can't solve problems by doing nothing. Nothing has ever been solved by doing nothing. So I wrote this book to address these concerns. In what way did capitalism and globalization fail over these past 20 years? And I look at free trade, I look at supply chains, I look at purchasing power, inequality, China, global warming. I even look at the meaning of life. But to get to that, you have to go to, through the whole book because that's the last chapter. Then you get the, uh, the answer there as well. And this is my take in summary. Yes, we have had 20 bad years. 20 years of shocks, disasters, and government failure on a massive scale. We've had 20 years of uh, global financial crises. We've had uh, endless wars. We've had chaos in the Middle East. We got a pandemic that shut down the world and killed millions. And now we have a massive industrial scale war in Europe. So. It's been bad, and I understand why the world seems like a dangerous place. But interestingly, these 20 awful years have also been the 20 best years in human history. When we look away from the headlines and the shocks and look to the trend lines and the objective indicators of human living standards, then we realize that around a third of all the wealth that the average human being has ever attained throughout all of human history was created over these past 20 years. Extreme poverty declined by more than 130,000 people every day over these 20 years, which means that every minute that we complained about how neoliberalism is destroying the world, more than 90 people were lifted out of extreme poverty, and it happened in the countries that integrated the most into gl the global economy. Child mortality was almost reduced by half, which means that last year, more, less than 4 million um, children fewer 
died then in 2002. And at the same time, inequality, global inequality as measured by the global Gini coefficient was reduced for the first time since the Industrial Revolution. At the same time, we saw an end of the long US wage stagnation. Uh, one hour of work now buys us four times more than in 1980, according to the Simon Abundance Index, looking at 50 basic commodities. Um, four times more than in 1980, according to this index um, led by Marian Tupi here at, at Cato. Especially purchasing power surged and the ability to buy goods, services, amenities, technologies is now at the peak of, of all of uh, human experience, which we can see when we look at people who fall below the poverty line in the US are more likely to own amenities like dishwashers, washing machines, dryers, air conditioning, uh, televisions, and, and of course cell phones and computers than the average American did in 1970. So it tells you that despite all those very real problems and disasters that are afflicting mankind, something was done right. And what was that? Why is it that so many things turn out well when everything went wrong over the past 20 years? Well, I think it's because human beings are problem solvers. And as long as we are free to adapt and change our ways and to innovate ourselves out of problems, we will do that. And we can see that during the pandemic. The world was shut down and the narrative was that free trade and global supply chains um, failed us. But what was it really that happened during this period? In fact, all those devastating shortages that we all thought would be the result of a world that shut down when half of the world population was under house arrest, when resources, inputs, intermediary goods did not cross borders, when uh, suddenly um, companies had to find new ways. Well, they did find new ways. They suddenly started to tweak the manufacturing process, to th started to think about what they could do with the workforce that was actually at hand, on hand. Uh, they started to think about what they could do with other resources, and they found new ways of distributing goods um, and, and services, which meant that in a manner of days, they began to deal with the most devastating shortages that we faced. Lots of us probably hoarded um, canned food and, and toilet paper because we thought we would run out of all these things. That was a reasonable assumption. But through heroic efforts, entrepreneurs and businesses rebuilt supply chains in real time. And trade also helped us to get all those personal protective equipment and face masks, giving local manufacturing companies the space and time to tweak their supply chains and product, uh, production so as to begin to produce these things. So trade and entrepreneurship saved us. Who did it the best? Which kinds of companies and countries? The answer might surprise you. Companies with complex supply chains were faster much quicker at rebuilding supply chains. They were less likely to see them break, and when they did, they were faster at finding new supplies and new opportunities than companies with shorter and less complex supply chains, which sounds weird to us. But those who have complex supply chains, they invest in alternatives. They have more options. They were always able to find some manufacturer or supplier of resource in some place that wasn't under lockdown at that particular moment in time. Whereas companies that only relied on one or two suppliers, they faced calamity once that area was under lockdown. So the lesson of the pandemic was not that complex supply chains and free trade failed us, but that they saved us and that concentrations of supply chains are much more dangerous than diversification. That's the reason why the traditional saying isn't put all your eggs in one basket and protect it with regulations and tariffs. 
because you only have to drop it once and then it's game over. As America found out after having repatriated production of infant formula, then all it took was problems in one factor in the spring of 2022 to create a national shortage. So my take is that everybody learned the wrong lesson from the pandemic and that free trade and globalization helps us to improvise and to adapt in a way that eggs in one basket doesn't. So Henry David Thoreau, the old transcendentalist writer and poet, uh, put it, he was right when doing so, trade and commerce seem to be made of rubber because they always manage to bounce over the obstacles which legislators are continually putting in their way. And I think that the most important lesson of all of this is that these, this adaptation, this constant rebuilding of supply chains and solutions did not happen because we had a supply chain SAR telling everybody where to get their resources, how to change manufacturing, whom to trade with. It only happened because we didn't have a supply chain SAR. Because all the knowledge on how to do these things is out there on factory floors, in small businesses, in the supply chains. They are the only ones who know what they're able to do, what they can stop doing without creating even more devastating shortages in other places, only by do, being out there and constantly f learning about the changing world through changes in price levels and in supplies. Only by doing that and exploiting that information could they, um, could they solve these problems. And that's why Lighthizer is wrong when saying that libertarianism or free markets is all about doing nothing. Yes, it's one no. It's one no to a big government plan to tell us all what to do. But that's the way to open up to a million yeses, to a million different solutions from the people who are the real experts, those who are out there knowing how the world is changing. And no, at no time is it more important for freedom to change ways according to a changing landscape as when the world is unpredictable and we face new strange situations that change rapidly. This is why all this government intervention that is now suddenly fashionable again. Tariffs, repatriation, active industrial policy, governments coming to the rescue and telling people what to do and at which price level and so on. It's not something new and exciting. It's something that we've tried to do again and again historically. And it has a very long and disappointing track record because it's just a way of replacing the wisdom of billions of people who constantly face new feedback to their various experiments and changing ways with the preferences of a few people at the top in government. And those people, they don't even risk their own money and they don't face constant feedback. They don't face market discipline to their actions which is why they fail much more often. It's price controls created shortages, tariffs destroy jobs and purchasing power, and attempts to use the taxpayers' money to second-guess our decisions have systematically thrown up mistakes, picked losers rather than than winners. Ship, old shipyards and steel plants, breed reactions and production of synthetic fuel from coal, Franco-British Concorde, France's Minitel, corn-based ethanol, Solyndra, and now the latest version is Foxconn in Wisconsin. Or do you remember Quiro? Well, you really should, because Quiro was the attempt to own the future by the French and the German government in 2005. Because they knew that a European search engine, a European Google, would be the way to own the digital future. They just knew that this was the future. And with millions and millions of the taxpayers' resources, they tried to build the future of the digital world. And it failed within a year. And now it's even difficult to, to find them when you use any of the other um, search engines on, online. My point is, it's not something new and exciting. It's something we've done again and again. If insanity is doing the same mistakes and uh, hoping for another result, then this new fashionable uh, 
pro-government intervention policy is the uh, hope of repeating the same kind of government overreach and expecting something else than costly government failure. And I understand the temptation to do this in a dangerous world. This is one reason why I think we've seen this surge in all kinds of pro-intervention uh, and big government ideas over the past 20 years. When you see a dangerous world with a pandemic, with war, with chaos and, uh, gov and, and uh, financial crisis, it's easy to long for this big government or strong man to protect us. But the thing is, we have to count to 10 and learn from history, learn from economic principles to see that, especially in a rapidly changing, unpredictable world, yes, we need to do something. And that something is best done by those who have the knowledge, all those millions and billions of actors on the market who stand in first line and respond to the price changes and the changes in supplies constantly. We have to be patient and not fall for the urge of having this one solution top down, the kind of lighthouse thing, do something. Because as H. L. Mencken pointed out, there is always one solution to every human problem, neat, plausible and wrong. And that's what I fear that we're heading for. Something that sounds neat, plausible, but will be wrong because it neglects all the fact that the world is a discovery process. And only by having more eyeballs looking at it and more brains throwing out more experiments and more innovation will we continue to solve problems as well as we've done over these past 20 years. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. Before I introduce our next uh, speaker, I just want to, would like to make an announcement that we will be taking questions from both the online and in-person audience after uh, the, the remarks. The online audience may join the conversation and submit questions directly to the event webpage, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter using the hashtag, hashtag Cato Events. Uh, let me introduce now Chris Griswold, who is the policy director at American Compass, a think tank that presents new conservative ideas uh, for today. His writings have appeared uh, in the New York Times, Newsweek, National Affairs, Dallas Morning News, and numerous other publications. He was previously a senior advisor to U.S. Senator Marco Rubio. He's a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and this summer he served as a Council on Foreign Relations Hitachi International Affairs Fellow and a visiting scholar at the Japanese government's Research Institute of Economy, Trade and Industry in Tokyo from where he just uh, is recently arriving. I believe that's part of the MIDI uh, program over there. Please help me welcome uh, Chris Griswold. so much. Um, Cato has always been very gracious about hosting diverse and differing viewpoints, so I'm, I'm grateful to be here. Um, I'm so glad you mentioned Indiana Jones. <laughs> uh, is this microphone on? Give them a, a second uh, to, to fix it. It looks like there's a, a glitch. So we've reached agreement on Indiana Jones. <laughs> That's nice. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Well, then I'll repeat the nice things I was saying about you so everyone can <laughs> hear. Uh, just to say uh, that I'm so glad to be back at Cato. Cato is, is gracious about hosting diverse opinions uh, with those who disagree with them. So I'm happy to be here. Um, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. This is the second time in recent weeks that I've been asked if I've seen it. And the person who asked me just a few weeks ago was a senior member of the Japanese government. The reason he liked the movie 
because of the way in which it depicts older wisdom needing to be reclaimed by a younger practitioner who doesn't know how to solve the problems confronting her and needs to turn back to the storied legend lessons of the past. Johan mentioned that these new, the new emerging bipartisan criticism from left and right uh, is a abandonment of the American experiment. Uh, and so I wanna spend most of my time, if I may, talking about American history because I don't think that's true at all. I think that's the right and the left returning to the American experiment and its best tradition. In 1791, Alexander Hamilton told the US Congress that the public purse must supply the deficiency of private resource. And what can it be so useful as in prompting and improving the efforts of industry? And Hamilton's view was that government was required both to impede private actors whose pursuits might not be in the national interest and also to assist economic pursuits that were in the national interest but beyond the capacity of private actors. In 1782, he said, to preserve the balance of trade in favor of a nation ought to be a leading aim of its policy. The avarice of individuals might frequently find its account in pursuing channels of traffic prejudicial to that balance to which the government may be able to oppose effectual impediments. And then he continues, there may, on the other hand, be the possibility of opening new sources, though which accompanied with great difficulties in the commencement, would in the event amply reward the trouble and expense of bringing them to perfection. The undertaking may often exceed the influence and capitals of individuals and may require no small assistance as well from the revenue as from the authority of the state. George Washington tended to agree. Uh, the first bill that he signed as president in 1789 was about the oaths that new congressmen had to take. The second bill was the Tariff Act of 1789, which protected American manufacturers from the flood of European imports that was threatening these nascent industries. The Articles of Confederation were not strong enough to have allowed the US government to do that. Well, now he could, and he did. Uh, Hamilton's American system, as this school of economics came to be known, uh, eventually won over longtime skeptic Thomas Jefferson, who was won over by observing the realities of, American affair, of, of world affairs as it affected America, including Britain's con uh, continued attempts to subject the US to its preferred free trade regime, whereby it hoped to smother American industry. In 1816, uh, rebutting those who were trying to dragoon his older views uh, into service for their view that we should continue to depend on Britain, Jefferson said, to be independent for the comforts of life, we must fabricate them ourselves. Shall we make our own comforts or go without them at the will of a foreign nation? Experience has taught me that manufacturers are now as necessary to our independence as to our comfort. Later generations of American leaders followed suit when declaring for his very first run for office in 1832, a young Abraham Lincoln in characteristically simple and wry style defined his platform. I am humble Abraham Lincoln. My politics are short and sweet like the old woman's dance. I'm in favor of a national bank. I'm in favor of the internal improvement system, what we would call infrastructure investment, and a high protective tariff these are my sentiments and political principles. In 1844, he put it even more simply, give us a protective tariff and we will have the greatest nation on earth. Uh, he governed accordingly as president uh, and it's a good thing he did. The North, committed as it was to industrial strength, was able to defeat the Confederacy, which had used its regime of racist chattel slavery as the engine of an agricultural economy disinterested in industrial investment and entirely committed to pursuing what it thought was its competitive advantage in exporting agricultural commodities. And just as an interesting historical note, the short-lived Confederate Constitution may be the best example in American history of trying to enshrine maximalist free market, what I would call free market fundamentalist principles. The Confederate Constitution said that no subsidies shall be granted from the treasury nor shall any duties or taxes on importations from foreign nations be laid to promote or foster any branch of industry. 
And just to put a, put a fine point on it, it also said that no clause contained in this Constitution shall ever be construed to delegate the power to Congress to appropriate money for any internal improvements intended to facilitate commerce. Of course, their economic strategy was as bankrupt as their moral cause, and it was defeated by the industrially and morally superior force. And we could go on. We could talk about the turn of the century and the realization of politicians that the successful companies that the company was birthing needed new operating parameters. Railway price gouging and discrimination. Railway workers routinely maimed without recourse. Tainted meat and food. An explosion of da dangerous child labor in industrial workplaces all demanded redress that the market did not seem to be providing. One Republican senator in 1906 declared, when any business becomes so great that it affects the welfare of all the people, it must be regulated by the government of all the people. The people cannot permit individuals or associations of individuals to practice methods hurtful to all, and the people have no agency for their protection except their government. And we could go on. We could talk about the 20th century, our wartime production strategy that helped us defeat fascism, the post-war period in which federal spending accounted for somewhere between one half and two thirds of all R&D spending, giving us the world's dominant economy. We could talk about NASA and DARPA, which did indeed help spawn many of the technologies that define our digital age. We could talk about Reagan's use of domestic content requirements in the 80s to force Japanese automakers to bring their production to the United States from which we still benefit. And we could talk about today in which, as Johan noted, the European Union and Japan and the G7 and many other nations are understanding and openly declaring that economic dependence on China is being weaponized by that country and constitutes a major national security threat. The Department of Defense just last year reported how the offshoring of industrial production and the decline in American capital investment over the last few decades constitutes a grave national security and economic threat, in the words of the report. So why, why the self-indulgent history lecture? I think history is awesome, so it's fun for me, but, but why the history lecture? Well, it's for two reasons. Uh, simply, uh, uh, the first reason is simply I just wanted this audience to hear that there's another perspective on offer. Um, the book we're talking about, which you should read, it's very readable and, and very good humored, and I think you'll enjoy it. So lest you be seduced by it while you're enjoying the book, I simply want to say that while I take issue with what much of the book claims, my bigger concern is with what it does not say. Uh, in reading it, you, you may come to think that there are only two economic perspectives on offer. On the one hand, the maximalist version of free market forces as unfettered as possible, leading to a completely integrated global economy, as few parameters as, as possible, and the maximal happiness that supposedly follows. Or else, on the other hand, tyranny, communism or fascism or plutocratic mobsterism, or some other version of a completely state-dominated and inevitably corrupt and cronyist economy. Um, but those are not the only two options. There's another option, one which I would call simply healthy capitalism, or maybe even more simply actual capitalism. In actual healthy capitalism, the market is unleashed to do what only the free market can do, optimizing and finding the most efficient solutions to problems, but within the reasonable rules and parameters required to make market forces work well. Because the market is not magic, it's not divine, it doesn't require our complete submission and unquestioning faith that we may have its blessings bestowed. It's a tool. It's the best one humanity's come up with so far, to be sure. Uh, and I share uh, Johann's enthusiasm for the market's remarkable power. But it's a tool, nonetheless. Uh, its operation does not inevitably lead to what is in the best interest of a nation or a community or a family or a worker. It only does that when good policy constrains it appropriately. Uh, and the second reason for my indulgent aside into history, not only does this option of healthy actual capitalism exist in theory, it exists in reality. In fact, it's the dominant story, certainly of American economic history and, and of many other nations. Um, one of the benefits of prosperity we may have seen in recent decades uh, is not the result of pure capitalism, but of the mixed economy, of capitalism as it is actually best practiced. And a critical feature of this healthy, actual capitalism frame 
is that it allows us to be honest. Uh, much is indeed better in the world now than say 40 years ago. Um, not wrong about that, but not everything. Many American workers really have suffered. Some families really are worse off. American national interests have in some cases really been weakened. And by looking honestly at that, we can consider the prudential judgments that good governing in the real world actually requires. That's how Hamilton won over Jefferson. Jefferson ultimately was forced to admit, in so complicated a science as political economy, no one axiom can be laid down as wise and expedient for all times and circumstances. Judgment is required. It's hard, it's messy, uh, but in my perspective, in my view, the solution is not to place our faith in an ideology that always knows the answer to every question before it's asked and the solution before the problem is described. Um, less government, less government, less government. Uh, as the great conservative Edmund Burke reminds us, circumstances with which some, for some gentlemen pass for nothing, give in reality to every political principle its distinguishing color and discriminating effect. The circumstances are what render every civil and political scheme beneficial or noxious to mankind. And the truth is that no one has yet succeeded in living according to the pure ideology of maxim maximalist market non-intervention a reality too quickly intervenes for that. Pretty much all economies are some version of a mixed economy. So the only question is how to do it well. And, and I'll finish just by saying that's why democratic government and its role in economic policy making is so essential. Um, Johan offers a, a lovely vision of the market as the place where we can all come together and by sharing our own creativity in the market accomplish things together that we could never accomplish apart. And so it is when the market is functioning in a healthy manner. But market forces can also drive us to exploit one another. They can allow the unbounded pursuit of profit to weaken communities and national strength. We must therefore consider the role of the other place where we meet and cooperate in order to accomplish what no one of us can accomplish alone. And we'll give Lincoln and Hamilton the last word. In 1854, Lincoln wrote, the legitimate object of government is to do for a community of people whatever they need to have done but cannot do at all or cannot so well do for themselves in their separate and individual capacities. Or as Hamilton might say, the undertaking may often exceed the influence and capitals of individuals and may require no small assistance as well as from the revenue as from the authority of the state. Um, in the q and I hope we can get into the particulars of different policy measures and policy measures that, that I would support or, or that Johan might support or oppose. But my primary message is simply that policy measures are okay in the first place. Not only okay for a strong and prosperous nation comprised of strong and prosperous industries, communities, families, and workers, it's necessary. That's actual capitalism and it's always been the American way when we're at our best. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. Well, I think we've established that there are two clearly different uh, points of views. Uh, Johan, there were, there were a lot of assertions and claims in a lot of uh, American history uh, in, the, in the talk, uh, much of which there is um, well, quite a bit of scholarship, some of it done here at the Cato Institute, uh, that I'm sure um, we could spend a lot of time on, which takes issue with those things. Do you want to say anything? Uh, in response before we go to questions and answers. Y yes, I, I think I should. Uh, I, I think this was incredibly helpful to sort out some of the differences between our, our two different visions of, um, of the world and of the economy. Um, but we share an interest in popular culture and Indiana Jones. Uh, and in Hamilton, uh, I just watched the musical for the first time, actually, and I thought it was great, but I thought it gave a uh, somewhat too um, uh, unsympathetic portrayal of Thomas Jefferson um, and Madison, and I think it bypassed some of the problems with Hamilton's policies. Um, and um, I think the, the best way of um, explaining that is to think about what he 
didn't put into his plan for the American economy. He did not, did not, he had a vision. He had a blueprint for how manufacturing and how the economy would work. What he didn't really think about was how this was also a, um, a jobs project for uh, attorneys and uh, lobbyists and uh, uh, various advocates of special interests. And I think it was the last time I met Milton Friedman, he pointed out that Hamilton thought that we really needed to give the, the steel industry a push. That's the old Hamiltonian argument. It's the, the perfect sort of infant industry argument. If we just help it along with subsidies and tariffs, then it will be able to prosper and make us prosperous in the future. Well, now, uh, Friedman pointed out, uh, now 200 years, 250 years later, we still give them subsidies and tariffs. Uh, based on the old Hamiltonian argument. So if you're an infant for 200, 250 years, there's something that's gone wrong over all that period. And obviously it is that it's never perfect. No plan uh, is able to survive uh, the first meeting with reality and with lobbyists. Uh, no plan, and that goes for businesses as well. Of course, we change plans all the time. But that's according to an adaptation, according to feedback from those who test the products, from um, investors who uh, constantly try to find out if this is the future or if it's not the future, and they spend their own, they risk their own money so that they give you reliable feedback, not according to who managed to capture the political process, and that's often the problem with the Hamiltonian argument. And then if you're interested in whether this is really what made America into such a successful place, I urge you to look at Douglas Irvin's book, uh, Clashing Over Commerce, on America's trade policies over all these years, where he, where he shows that the productivity gains and what really made America successful were really the places that couldn't be protected by tariffs because they were domestic um, service sectors, utilities, transportation, and retail, and, and things like that. And um, there was always the argument being made that we, we might need some of the, that protection for security purposes. But again, I understand that, and I think it's worth investigating our supply chain, see where do we get our resources, what's really essential to us. And is there a case to be made there? And then what you realize, it's rarely sort of steel, it's rarely the kind of st strong big business uh, uh, ventures. They're very good at making the arguments, but that's rarely where it's at. I think that Defense Secretary Mattis, when he faced the, pro the argument that we, we're going to need all this steel if we end up in war, yeah, we're going to need about 3% or if we're going to play it safe, double it into 6% of the steel production that we currently have in the US. Uh, the rest is what the lobbyists have been able to, to make a case for, but it's not really the, the reality. Now, what's really essential and where there is a strong argument I would make is minerals and metals. In some of those areas, we face in Europe and in the US a, too much of a reliability on some countries that do not necessarily wish us well. But what do we do then? Is it necessarily sort of going to, to full-blown protectionism? I would suggest that one thing we could do is to exploit the, exploit the resources we already have. When it comes to um, rare earth minerals that we need now in lots of high-tech manufacturing and especially in green tech, they're not really rare. We've got them everywhere. It's just that we, because of our own regulations and environmental concerns, we don't want to exploit them. In fact, most of the rare earths that we know of was actually discovered in my own country, in Sweden. And we just found some of the largest uh, resources up in Kirna in northern Sweden. It's just that we think that, nah, uh, we'd rather want somebody else to, to do it. I think that's a case for more of deregulation and, and opening up those, uh, those resources. We just got this, these supplies of lithium might be the biggest ones anywhere in the Nevada, Oregon territory. So perhaps we should look to our own resources. That's 
a case to be made, but not necessarily through protectionism and subsidies, but just allowing entrepreneurs to do their job. Um, but the last point, when I listen to Chris and you make an eloquent case that there are risks out there and we really have to think through how we are going to be successful in the future. I would just say when you're looking at Europe, for example, and the uh, a more heavy-handed intervention from uh, many governments there and more active industrial policy, I would caution you, <laughs> um, be careful what you wish for, <laughs> because in Europe right now the discussion is why aren't we more successful? We should be looking more to what America has been doing over the past few decades, because they seem to be doing much better than us. Fifteen years ago the American economy and the EU economy was almost of a similar size. Uh, now the American economy is 30 times 30% bigger, and if you exclude Britain, it's 50% bigger than the European Union economy. So it's not necessarily the case that something is broken and has to be fixed, just because people do things in a different ways in other places. Thank you. Uh, when we put out our, our critical mineral supply chain proposal, I'll, I'll happily say endorsed by Johan Norberg. <laughs> Um, I would just, just to say, I, I would agree with you on the deregulation point. Uh, we badly need permitting reform, for example, um, NEPA reform to allow us to build more than we do, to allow us to mine more than we do. Uh, I think my broader point is simply that it's useful and necessary uh, for governments to take an actual perspective and say, yes, actually, critical minerals, rare earths do matter in a unique way. Um, they need to make that active judgment and then deliberately pursue a suite of policy measures to do something about it. Some of that may be deregulation, sure, of course, um, but not necessarily all of it. And just a really, a really good obvious example is, is to say that some supply chains are better than others. We are now so radically dependent on China, not just for the, the raw materials, but for the processing capacities. We ship it all there, even the stuff we do mine, we ship it there and they have to ship it back. Um, China can and has in the past cut off that flow to us and to other countries like Japan in response to political provocations they didn't like, and that's completely unacceptable. So whether that's getting out of our own way at home, whether that's investing and giving domestic uh, operators the, the, the financial support they may actually need to get off their feet so that China doesn't undercut them by dropping the price while they're trying to stand up, or that means coming to agreement with other countries that are that, that represent better supply chains, whether it's Australia and Canada and so on. Um, my broader point is that none of that can happen without policymakers making an active judgment. This industry matters in a special way. This 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 category of, of product matters in a special way. And we're going to do something to make sure that it's secure. Let's go to, to uh, questions from the audience. If you have a question, please raise your hand and uh, wait for me to call on you and then wait for the microphone and then uh, uh, identify yourself and your affiliation and the question, uh, the person you're asking the question to. Does anybody have uh, an initial question? Okay, we'll go to an online uh, question. Um, this is a very broad uh, question. Uh, how do you respond to massive wealth creation in the hand, hands of so few? Does trickle down still work? <laughs> I guess that's aimed at that's me. That's to you. Um, you know, I don't understand the whole trickle down metaphor. That's not what free markets is about. It's about generally unleashing different experiments and innovation in as many places as possible. And then people move into those sectors that are successful and they benefit if they do something, if they move to the areas of the economy where they produce more value to other people. That's not really trickle down. That's go out and get it uh, by, by creating opportunities. Now, does that still work in terms of the 
massive concentration of wealth that we're seeing, you know, there are different ways of thinking about that. And I do have a chapter on inequality in the book. And the first one is that um, it's not that massive. You know, when William Nordhaus, the Nobel laureate, tries to find out, so how much do very successful entrepreneurs capture of the value that they create when they introduce new goods and services and methods into the economy? Uh, how much of the social value above the uh, average normal rate of return? And his conclusion is that they capture something like 2.2%. Now, that's not a lot, because to be able to do that, they have to create value for consumers, they have to pay their workers, they have to pay their suppliers, they have to pay their lenders. Only if they manage to do that and get something left, that's the profit. And that's just 2.2% after having taken all these risks. Now, that's a lot of money if you introduce the iPhone or if you introduce the barcode or uh, some sort of goods and services that everybody wants to use. And that's a lot of money, that's a lot of billions, and that will look bad if, you're one of, if you fear uh, this concentration of wealth. But if they manage to make that money on a free market, it means that they've supplied us with social value and profits that are much, much greater. So I think that capitalism is a great deal for those of us who sit on our couches watches, watching Netflix, not taking those risks because the entrepreneurs are out there doing it for us. And the other way of, of responding to that then is look at all those goods and services and technologies and the capabilities that you have and that are important in your life. I would dare to say that those things are more equally distributed than ever before in human history. So we haven't increased inequality just because the richest ones have more dollars and cents in their bank accounts. The things that make life easier and more comfortable and better to us, that's more equally distributed. And why is that? That's because some people like the Steve Jobses and the Bill Gateses and the Sam Waltons were allowed to become super rich by reducing the price of all those goods and services. So even if I wouldn't want to call it trickle-down economics, it still works. <laughs> you have a chapter uh, that looks just at industrial policy, and you look at all sorts of uh, examples of industrial policy. So uh, I have a question uh, for you, which is, did you find any prominent examples of industrial policy that really worked? I'm sure Chris will come up with something <laughs> when I fail to respond to, uh, or come up with something myself. You know, there are examples where you can point to, look, this is something, a new venture or a new project, they got a lot of government funding and it succeeded in the end. And uh, I I'm sure that Chris will give me some examples. But the thing is, if you splash money around in so many different places, you're bound to touch something that will be successful in the end. I, I remember when I looked into industrial policy for real for the first time, I noticed that there were some 49 American states who had an industrial policy to create a biotech cluster in their own state. And by this time, it's probably 50, I'm sure. <laughs> Which means that if one of them succeeded in coming up with a biotech cluster, I'm sure there would be a lot of people saying that, look, this is industrial policy. It worked out in the end. Uh, but that's not necessarily the case, because you also have to look at the failures. As Josh Lerner put it in his Boulevard of Broken Dreams, uh, I can see lots of successes of industrial policy, but for each of them, I can point to 100 failures. And that's fine, you often fail, but the problem with industrial policy, when you don't risk your own money, when you don't have feedback on the market, you throw away the mechanisms whereby failure is a good thing. It's a learning process, that's what it is. I mean, Google fails all the time as well, and Apple did all the time as well. But when they do it on the market, it's a discovery process by which time they get decent, honest feedback, not from lobbyists or for, from political interests, but from customers uh, who say that this is a bad idea, and then channeling capital and labor to other places that are more successful. Failure is good if you have that 
openness for trial and error and that market discipline. If not, then you will continue to throw good money after bad money. Did you want to say anything about that? You look like you do. I, I uh, want to say a few things. Okay. <laughs> My question to you will be, what are the dangers of industrial policy? Are there any? I, I think the, the thing that makes industrial policy or, or just a, a more uh, uh, active policy perspective challenging is that it's harder than what I would call an ideological perspective that, that always knows that the answer is, is hands off. And so I really appreciate your acknowledgement that, that sometimes uh, it works and that sometimes it may be necessary. Um, the question is how to do it well. And, and, and the point about feedback is important. If you look at the history of uh, successful industrial policy, for example, in many of the East Asian nations that succeeded in rapidly uh, advancing up the economic ladder, in the 20th century, a feature through, among other things, very active industrial policy. One of the features of that industrial policy when it worked well was rigorous feedback loops, where it was less about picking winners and propping them up even though they couldn't be competitive, and was more about letting losers fail quickly. So if you wanted, continued, you, if you wanted to continue to enjoy the benefits of whatever the, the plan was, subsidies, protection from import competition or whatever, um, you had to perform. You had to show, in some cases, just show me the, the numbers of your exports or you're out. Um, and that's a feature of, of the industrial policy approaches that worked in those contexts. So, uh, I mean, without being cheeky, if, you, if you're asking for examples of when, it, when it's worked, I would just point to the South Korean and the Japanese and the Taiwanese economies <laughs> and the fact that they are so successful now. It doesn't mean that every specific thing they tried worked. But overall, they found a plan that, 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 that catapulted them. And in the US, we have, we have plenty of examples. Um, uh, the moonshot is obviously the obvious example, where we, we decided we wanted to go to the moon, and, and we did. And you write about that in, in the book. Um, but there are many others. Um, and, and again, the, 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 the idea that industrial policy has to be about some senator sitting in an office deciding specifically what kind of semiconductor we need is the way that, that that's, that's not how it works when it works well. DARPA works well because it's an iterative process in which people can experiment and fail relatively free from political interference. And the spillovers of that, same thing in NASA, the spillovers, spillovers of that are remarkable and have led to arguably the entire digital age uh, that we enjoy. It's, because not, it's not because government replaced the private sector, it's because of a healthy public-private ecosystem inside a, a reasonable policy environment. Um, you could look at Israel, for example, which just decided that it was going to be the startup nation and did. If you qualified for government support, you could come and get it. And now they're, you know, ha have this, you know, massive active startup economy that they, they just decided they were going to have and, and created. Um, so there are plenty of examples. And if I could just say one really quick thing, just so that I don't leave the inequality point unchallenged, uh, if you're interested in an alternative point of view, you can check out our website. We developed something called the Cost of Thriving Index, which measures how much it would, how many weeks of work in a year it would take an average American worker to afford the basic necessities of a decent middle class life. And that index number has gotten worse for the average, average worker. In 1985, it took about 40 weeks of work on average to afford those necessities. Now it takes about 62 weeks, which is more weeks than there are uh, in, in the year. Um, and you can take a look at that. Uh, and if you're interested in the fights we've had about that methodology, we did a big <laughs> event with AEI. Uh, you can look at that debate as well. Um, but I, I didn't want to let that point go unchallenged because life really is indeed worse off for a lot of American workers. That feeling that it's harder than it used to be is in some cases uh, mathematically proven out by, by, by the data. I seem to remember that there was a Wall Street piece on the various thoughts about this index where um, the writer said that most economists tend to agree with AEI's criticism of the cost of thriving index, but it doesn't feel like it at 3 a.m. when you do the calculations. Um, and that's an important point, I think. That goes to my whole point about the last 20 years. We've experienced the sense that the world is getting more dangerous. But in that case, the most important thing is count to 10 and go through the data and the um, economic science 
to, to find out what's correct. I'd just like to say something about the industrial policy argument here, which I think you raised good points and honest points. Because when you point to South Korea and Taiwan as the primary examples of active industrial policy, you also make the case that, yeah, they were brutal. They, when they noticed that something didn't work on global markets, they killed the project and stopped handing them subsidies. And that's a way of making it more successful. But it's also important to point out then that this goes against this whole temptation to have active industrial policy because it would somehow be create these cushy jobs. The traditional idea of the, you know, the 1950s and 60s, and you had jobs in manufacturing for life, even if the company isn't very productive. You kill unproductive businesses. That's what you do, and channel labor and capital into the more successful places. If you do that, if you imitate market forces like that, you will be more successful. But then I think an important reason why South Korea and Taiwan, which I agree are some of the more better cases of industrial policy than what we've had when we tried to do it in Sweden and the US. One reason why they could is that those countries faced existential risks. They knew that they could be invaded at any point of time. They couldn't be wasting resources. They had to build their economies. So they didn't leave much room for the lobbyists and for the uh, getting business into your uh, constituency is more important than creating thriving, productive, innovative businesses. And yet they also face their problems. But I would say that's an experience that it would be difficult for Sweden and the US to uh, import because we don't face, or at least we don't think we face the same kind of existential risks. Arvind Panagaria at Columbia University, too, has done quite a bit of work on those economies, and uh, his conclusion is completely, <laughs> completely different, that in fact, those industrial policies failed uh, by their own measures, and he looked at which, which industry succeeded when and, and uh, came to very, very different conclusions. So has Ann Kruger, another uh, eminent economist. We have time for one or two uh, more questions from the audience, and we'll take one here in front. I'm Bill Klein, a retired physician. I'm curious about if you have any comments about the economics of all this in terms of modern capitalism, particularly the part of it I'm interested in is national debt. That's one thing that the United States has now that seems to be exploding. I don't know about the rest of the world. I've heard even China has debt, so I'm not sure who the creditors are. But if you have any comments on where debt f figures into all this or any other economic aspects of it. After you. Well, everybody has um, amassed incredible wealth and uh, debt in the last uh, 20 years because they don't want to be honest with their voters if you're thinking about public debt because everybody wants the benefits and the social security but they don't want to pay for it. And especially then during the pandemic, we've seen this massive expansion of uh, public programs and of stimulus measures all around the world, um, actually a little bit less in Sweden than, than in other places. And that's not related to what kind of economy, if it's capitalism or communism. Um, I'd say it's dependent on not, being, not having an adult conversation with your voters. In China, it looks even worse. And the reason is that they pretended that the 2008 bust never happened. So as the rest of the world realized that, okay, we've spent too much on real estate and some debts over here. We need to have the uh, bubble to deflate a little bit. They just went on stimulating and throwing good money after bad money. In, and you could say in a massive uh, version of industrial policy, just putting more cheap credit into real estate and infrastructure. So they reckoning is going to happen but it's happening right now in china you could say because they can't keep that running for much longer and who who has lent them that money well all of us and our our children and our our grandchildren are gonna have to pay for it i'm afraid okay did you want to say something i i did i just wanted okay. to on the one hand agree that, that that of course debt matters and inflation is a real thing that you can cause by spending too much um, but it's useful in my mind to ask, as Johan rightly pointed out, who, 
who owns that debt and why do they own it? And I don't know that you can answer that question without also talking about our trade debt, not just our national debt, fiscal debt. Um, what has happened over the last few decades is that we have ha we, we've found ourselves in such an imbalanced trade situation that rather than uh, paying for our imports with our exports, we're paying for our imports by selling our assets, real estate, corporate equities, treasury debt, and that is an unsustainable long-term. So you can get away with that for a year or two, but as a national strategy, as a way of doing business, it's fundamentally unsustainable. And if we continue to finance our dependence on cheap imports by selling our financial assets to, for example, China or many other foreign invest purchasers of our debt, um, we are mortgaging our, our future claims on our economy. Um, it's one of the reasons why a more balanced trade situ situation is so important. And I, I don't want to let a question about the national debt uh, go by without also mentioning how important our trade debt is, is to that, that, that question. Maybe we can agree that uncontrolled government spending is a big problem. We'll take, Indiana Jones. We'll take, uh, we'll take uh, one last question from the gentleman here. Uh, uh, thank you uh, to, to the panel. I, I work at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change in London, England, uh, for our former Prime Minister, so obviously from Europe, like yourselves, Johan. And my question to both panelists is, how would you apply your ideas to healthcare especially? Because it's often said that European countries are a mixture of capitalist and socialist kind of economy. So obviously <coughs> the large welfare programs, but also in Britain, of course, uh, healthcare is a huge political issue with uh, those who want to keep the National Health Service free at the point of use uh, and those who perhaps want to move to a more American model. Uh, and also given the pandemic and the role of the WHO during that, what are your thoughts on that? At the Tony Blair Institute, we've helped set up something called the Global Health Security Consortium working with the Larry Ellison Institute for Transformative Medicine and the University of Oxford to look at some of the challenges uh, which have arisen from the uh, uh, the experience of the pandemic. So I just love your thoughts on uh, how your idea is especially applied to healthcare. Thank you. Oh yeah, that goes a long way and that's a broad question in its own right. Uh, so let me um, try to respond in a way that relates to uh, the discussion about innovation and, and growth and so on. Because yeah, we all have different ways of handling our healthcare system and where it seems like nobody has really worked out the, the perfect way of, of doing it. In Europe, we've often tried to make sure that we, um, we have government or regional government uh, intervention at least paying for most procedures uh, through taxpayers, not necessarily always public providers, but pri often private ones. But how do you do that when demand is uh, limitless? Well, you restrict supply in various ways. So the trade-off is that you don't necessarily give people the treatment that they uh, want and need at that particular moment in time. You can do this through patient fees uh, in various places, but often just by waiting in line, which is often a uh, one of the big uh, discussions in every election campaign. So how many weeks, how many months are you supposed to wait when you have a cancer diagnosis before you have um, some kind of um, a treatment? But the other important issue is you know, medical technology. How do you create methods, medical technology, new drugs, and make them enter the market at an earlier stage? And oftentimes we're trying to reduce the costs by making sure that somebody else pays for all that investments and the first dollars going into new experimental treatments. And what we've seen over the past few decades is that European healthcare systems often rely on drugs, medical procedures and technologies that have been tried, tested and reduced in price in the US for a long time before. And that's one reason why the American system seems less equitable, because uh, 
Some people who pay more get better access to treatment. Well, in Europe, we wait with those procedures uh, entirely until they've come down in price so that we can hand them to others. So there are no perfect solutions, just trade-offs, and they are difficult. Thank you. I am afraid that, uh, did you want to say something? Uh, I, I, I'll defer to you. Okay, you can, you can say something. Well, I would just agree that there, there is, you're asking us to touch the third rail of, of American <laughs> politics, certainly. It's a dangerous thing to do in DC. Um, there is certainly no perfect solution. Um, but if you look at, at the way in which the US spends more than, than anyone else, any other nation on healthcare with mixed results, you see this kind of massive self-dealing in the, in the private sector. Part of our problem is that costs are so high. And, and my one thought is, is, is simply to suggest that, that you might consider that not everything should be a market or be thought of as a market. Because in some instances, the normal rules of market forces don't seem to apply that well. Um, even simple things like price signals uh, don't really work when you are in an ambulance on the way to the emergency room and have to pay whatever whatever's put in front of you. It's the reason why we eventually had to uh, create public services like firefighting, <laughs> because back in the day, you had to wait until your house is on fire and then charge you whatever they could, right? Because you'd have to pay it to put the fire out. Um, some things don't work particularly well in a pure mar market context. And in my opinion, healthcare is, is one of them. Thank you. Um, I invite everybody to look at the work that uh, we've done on healthcare to get a completely different point of view of the history of healthcare in the United States. And uh, it's not uh, a complete free market. It's I not a complete free market, and that uh, that, that's part of the point. Um, when you write a book called The Capitalist Manifesto, it covers a lot of ground, and I'm afraid that today we've only been able to touch the surface on so many issues, but I think it was useful to have this conversation. I, I encourage all of you to, to buy and read uh, Johan's book. It really does uh, cover a lot of ground and does it well, including uh, addressing the, the new uh, challenges uh, to, to markets and uh, globalization and so on including chapters on China, on um, industrial policy, and so on. Um, and I want to thank both of our speakers today for joining us uh, for what has been a very good discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.